Okay. So uh, maybe we can begin. Uh, it's August 19th, 2015. Uh, this is an interview with uh, Chuck Edwards taking place in Saskatoon. Interviewer is Eric Weidenhammer. Um, you could start by uh, give us your name and age to begin with. Uh, my name is Chuck Edwards, and I'm 71. Maybe let me just zoom in a little bit here so that I get the tripod out of the screen. Thanks. And, uh, and where were you born? I was born in Arvida. Do you know where that is? No, no. It's in the, uh, on the Saguenay River up near uh, northern Quebec. Okay. And I was born there because my father worked for Alcan. Um, your father worked for Alcan. Uh, did your mother do? No, my mother, after she got married, um, was a, a mother, like housekeeper. But oh. she did have a master's degree in chemistry. That's it. <laughs> what did you do as a child to pass the time? Uh, when I was young, I played. I mean, I, uh, yeah. Um, we lived in, uh, I grew up in St. Lambert, which is a small town. Well, it was a small town. Right across the river from uh, Montreal, <clears throat> you cross the Victoria Bridge, and you get to Montreal. It's where the first lock of the school is. Mm -hmm. And when I was there, it was about 10,000 people, and there was a lot of uh, empty space, so there were open fields. It was a great swamp we used to play in that mm -hmm. my parents didn't know about. And, uh, so, yeah, I, growing up, I was mostly, uh, I played sports. Uh, I biked, I swam, I ran around. Is it a Francophone community? Uh, when I was there, about 50 50. Okay. And, um, it was interesting. The um, they were a separate, separate community. The, 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 the standard in Quebec, sip. But um, we went to different schools and we went to different churches. Um, but um, not so much in grade school. We met in high school. Started playing organized sports. Um, that was all. It was, it was bilingual because we were all. We're all, we're all bilingual, mm -hmm. and so you use whatever language is handy at the time. So football, hockey, you know, or about, uh, you know, there was no, you know, nobody trying to make sure we spoke English half the time and French half the time, but whatever it was, you just used it. So we were, mm -hmm. and, um, I, later when I worked here in the federal government, I worked uh, for a while in the federal government, they wanted me to go to language training. And uh, I went to the first uh, session in a room like this, and, I said, I don't really need this. I mean, I grew up speaking French. I said, I'd talk to him. So I talked to him for a while, and he says, where'd you learn that? And I said, play hockey. And he says, I, I know what you mean, but it's not polite. <laughs> so. Uh, did you find you had an early passion for uh, science or engineering or metallurgy in particular? Um, I had a passion for science. I liked, I liked science and math. Uh, uh, and. Um, my father had a PhD in chemistry, and he was—he probably would have been better off in his life if he'd been a professor instead of, uh, you know, working for Alcan or something like that. So I got a lot of chemistry lectures, you know, over dinner. I was actually in second year university before I learned any chemistry from anybody but my father. But <clears throat> what I didn't know was what I wanted to be. I knew what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. um, just generally. And, uh, and my mother tells a story that uh, she knew before I knew. Because uh, the year I turned five, so the summer I was four, uh, we built what I what we call a fort, and basically a wooden lean to uh, against the house. And uh, I can remember building it myself, but obviously I didn't. But my mother says, while my father was building it, my brother was there with a hammer, which is dangerous because he's not good with tools. And I spent my time with a little notebook making drawings, so she knew. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I was in, actually in grade 10. We didn't have much in the way. We had no uh, career training at all. It didn't exist. And we had a sort of career day once a year. Some people would come in and talk to you for a while. And, uh, uh, well, until I was in grade 10, I figured I'd be a Mountie because they had the best outfit. You know? But uh, a guy came in grade 10. He started, when I was in grade 10, he started talking about what he was doing. And I said, that's what I want to do. What do you do? He said, I'm an engineer. I said, all right. That was it. So. I was lucky he showed up. <laughs> yeah. Could you tell us a bit more about your uh, about your education into into university? Well, I went to um, grade school and high school in St. Lambert. Um, the uh, with Chambly County High School. I think their name has changed now. Uh, but St. Lambert was a fairly affluent town. 
and our school was very, very academically oriented. Um, for most of us, it was a, an assumption you were going to go to university. You know, so the question was, what are you going to study? And in the high school graduating class when I graduated, I I don't remember anybody who didn't go to university. So it was that that kind of school. Mm -hmm. um, but I decided I wanted to go to uh, Queens, so I spent uh, another year in uh, at high school in Montreal, getting a grade twelve. So we were in Queens. So. Uh, what classes did you enjoy uh, when you were at university? I like pretty much everything except organic chemistry. I see. Which it really <laughs> just was. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I, uh, I mean, I, I, I understood it. I just, I liked the physical chemistry. Uh, but uh, I was lucky. I was in a, uh, I took a, I took a course that may have disappeared from Queens, but it was called Engineering Chemistry. And you were taught under in the, in the chemistry department mostly. But then you also took the, the uh, basic course where that engineering did. So the first year you did uh, field school, you did survey, you did uh, some civil, some uh, civil, some, some uh, mechanical, uh, geology, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. So, um, as I said, the uh, it was, it was, it was, it was, it filled your time. I remember in my first year I had one spare, one, one spare in the whole week. So I kind of uh, resented the guys, because there were a whole batch of people in most of my chemistry classes who were in arts and science chemistry. And they had like 12 spares. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I didn't, uh, it was a, um, I think it was a very, very, it was initially designed to produce chemists for, uh, you know, uh, not research chemists, but uh, BSc chemists to work in industry, mm -hmm. but uh, it had drifted a lot, an uh, awful lot uh, since I was there. Uh, a number of us went to um, uh, law school. Uh, a number of us went on to graduate school. There were very few of us that actually went like that. Went to work in industry as a, as a chemist. So, and then, uh, then I went back. So, so uh, what made you? Uh, how, how did you become interested in? Interested in in mining and metallurgy? <laughs> well, it was it was an accident. Um, the uh, actually when I uh, when I went back to grad school, I told you I went back to grad school. I actually thought I would be a professor, but uh, a few years in grad school indicated to me that I didn't want to spend my life, the rest of my life at a university. So I was sort of veering off, and. Um, after I left school, I had a trouble, had trouble getting a job for a while, and um, Inca uh, offered me a job. Uh, even a, it was just a, uh, a temporary job at a research lab in Mississauga doing rotation research, because I knew enough surface chemistry to, to do that. So I got on with Inco, and uh, I guess I did a good job because they kept me on, and uh, that was it. So I've been in mining and metallurgy ever since, and it's not. Uh, frankly, before I did that, I did, when I was in graduate school, I certainly wasn't preparing to be in the mining industry. But I wasn't preparing to be in any industry. I was just, you know, carrying on this fairly exotic research and we were going to see what happened afterwards. So, mm -hmm. and in the end, it's all application of it, it, uh, math, physics, chemistry, one way or the other. So, do you remember anything in particular about your first day on the job at uh, at Inco? Yes, I, I met a lot of people, um, and um, I, I, I had some difficulty in university uh, the last few years I was there, so I made kind of a fuss. And <laughs> but uh, one of the fellows who had been in undergrad with me was already there in the lab, and uh, the thing that startled me was, you know, uh, I guess he told some stories. And the uh, part when they people met me, uh, a couple of days later they came back. That most people had two one one of two comments, and one was. If you really did what I heard you did, you're crazy. And the other one was, you're not as big as we thought you'd be. <laughs> so that's what I remember. Um, I also remember that um, the lab we worked in, the, the Met Lab, was in the basement of the building, and it was there were no windows because the basement. It was all gray. I mean, the counters, the, the laptop were gray, and the floor was gray, and the desks were gray. And a couple of us, uh, the first few weeks I was there, asked that they, you know, tune it up, make it a little, a little brighter. 
And what we got told was, oh, we're going to put up some nice pictures. You know? So they did. And the pictures they put up were charcoal drawings of equal operations. I says, oh, good. <laughs> that's, that's really nice. So it was a great place to work, though. How long did you work there, and where did you go afterwards? I was two years there, um, basically doing flotation research. And um, at the time, Inco had a mine in uh, Manitoba <clears throat> called Pipe Mine. It was an open pit. So relatively cheap to mine, but the ore had a lot of asbestos in it, and it was didn't process properly given the old processes. So I spent most of that two years looking at pipe ore, trying to figure out um, how to deal with it. And um, it actually made some really interesting discoveries. And uh, the uh, after I'd been there a couple of years, the uh, the better for worse, I went up to Inco sent me up to Thompson um, to talk to the people there about processing pipe ore. <laughs> when I arrived, <laughs> they'd been told ahead of time that I was the corporate expert on processing pipe ore, right, which was not true. And uh, in fact, I didn't want to be in the lab. I hadn't been in the industry before. So luckily, I arrived early in the day, and I had a couple of friends there already, and they toured me through the mill. So that by the time I gave my talk in the afternoon, I could actually talk about it. I could have seen it. So, um, that was, and then not long after that, I asked, I got asked to go to Thompson um, to help set up the part of the mill to actually run the pipe ore. So I, I did that. So, so your your research ideas were implemented in processing the earth. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, and they still are. I was I was in Thompson a few weeks ago on a, on a job for uh, Enoch Buster Wheeler here, and the basics of the process they're using there, um, dealing with these uh, high magnesium, magnesium oxide ores, are basically. Uh, Came out of my research back in the 70s. So it's, uh, well, it's nice to see it. It was, you know, it was actually useful research. So, yeah. so what was your pro? Uh, your, uh, how did you proceed towards um, the uranium industry? Um, well, um, I worked for uh, INCO and um, I was there a couple of years and things were slowing down. And uh, the, uh, so I, I was looking for another job and there was a job open in uh, Ottawa. Or uh, elder on nuclear, so um, I went down and interviewed, and uh, they hired me there. So that was uh, that was my first. I, I'd been aware of uranium and, and uh, nuclear power and so on beforehand. Um, when my father graduated his PhD, he was in the states, and his uh, professor said he had a job for him that he'd have to stay in the states for, and it was very hush hush that he wanted. And uh, my father said he wanted to go back to Canada. So we went to our writer for Alcan. The job he turned down was with the Manhattan Project. Wow. So, uh, so I'd been aware of uranium and uh, vaguely. And uh, El Dorado was a, a good place for me. It was a, it was a lot of fun. So, uh, how did you uh, eventually be uh, become involved with uh, with Amec uh, Foster Wheeler? I've been here for almost seven years now. So, uh, but. Uh, I, I'd known uh, the job I had before this was with chemical, and mm -hmm. I was their, uh, the, the uh, director of engineering projects. So I did a lot of hiring of consultants um, when I was there. And uh, when I decided to chemical, I aimed it for going to bring me to, to hire me. So that I knew from working with AMEC people that it um, would be a good place to work. So I, so I came here. So, and then we turned into AMEC Buster Wheeler a while ago. So what sort of research was done at, was done at Cameco? Cameco originally had a, um, a well, I was, in, I was in the research lab in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were doing a lot of research. Oh, well, we, there were uh, discoveries. Uh, you know, some of them drug ore. We were testing to see if the, you know, this, what they were finding in exploration was, was processable, which was useful. Uh, we did a lot of work on trying to improve operations. Uh, at the time, um, El Dorado owned, uh, when I was there, owned the, the, the big uranium mine they owned was Giver Lunch, way up in northern Saskatchewan. And we did a lot of work there on um, improving the operation. And um, I, was, I was lucky because uh, in my fourth year in undergrad at Queen's, I took a course in um, computer programming. So that would have been 1964, 65. And that was the first year Queen's taught computer programming. So for most people my age, I was sort of ahead of the curve on, on, on using computers. And when I was at um, 
El Dorado, we were having a lot of trouble with some of the, uh, the leaching, the butyrolage. So we actually, we had, before I arrived there, they developed a really nice little apparatus that had the, the superbly mimicked the uh, leaching equipment in, uh, in butyrolage. Although, you know, it was a tank like this was uh, literally thousands of times smaller than the equipment. But we did a factorial design test, right? And it turned out that the way, what, the way we thought the, uh, Process the leaching process. What affected the leaching process? They they were highly confounded. No, we hadn't realized that before. So the result of that was we got the got the plant working the you know, best it ever did. So that was that was fine. This was an application of computers. Well, it was an application of uh, it's a factorial design, it's a statistical way to design experiments so you get the most information out of the least work, and you don't do the variables one one variable at a time. You do all factor at the same time, so you find out how they're how they're confounded. So that was uh, that was interesting, and we one of the projects we bought we uh, at the time was uh, Kilik. Um, the federal government changed the rules so that a foreign company couldn't own 100 percent of the uranium operation. El Dorado got part of um, the uh, Kilik project, and our co-partner uh, on that didn't have much experience in uranium processing, so El Dorado uh, carried the load there. And I was assigned to come here to Saskatoon for some meetings and also uh, other places where the actual testing was being done. And uh, I actually, uh, I still have it because I found it later, but I wrote a little four-page memo on a plane back to Ottawa one time that said basically, this is not going very well. The test work was not well planned and well managed and uh, we better put somebody who knows what they're doing on this job or we're going to lose our shirt. But I filed it. Nothing happened. The fellow who uh, ran the lab came into my office and said, you know, we got to go downtown. They want to see you. So we went down there. We were in the VP operations. They had a big, big, big desk and nothing on it except point memo. And I thought, oh, shit. <laughs> I'm in trouble. And uh, he said, uh, we've read your memo and we agree and you're it. Said, what do you mean? I meant you're, you're, our, you're taking charge for us. I will I'll test it. So I ended up, I was tell you the truth, I was slightly out of my depth, um, but you know, uh, I think when that happens, what you do is you make like a duck, you know, calm above and pat like hell underneath. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I ended up being one of the two design engineers for Kilik, so, which was fun, that was good. Could you describe some of the technologies uh, involved in mining Kilik? Well, Kilik, uh, Kilik at the time, um, the average grade of the ore bodies there was two and a half, three, three and a half percent. Uh, which by today's Athabasca standards is not high grade. Today's Athabasca mine high grade is 20%. But at 3.5% three and three and was the highest grade anybody's seen at the time. And still, by global standards, it's very high. So um, there was a lot of uh, worry about uh, how to process the high grade ore. And also the ore had nickel in it, which some of the Athabasca, so that complicated things. So um, we did a lot of work on looking at uh, various um, leaching systems and we ended up with uh, autoclaves, which were they worked very well. Right? Great machines. Um, we had a, we did a lot of work on um, designing the blending system so we kept it because uh, with a high grade ore or body like that there's some very high grade spots and some very low grade spots and we had to blend them to get a steady feed to the mill. Um, we had a lot of discussion at the time whether we'd use a sag mill because at the time, sag mills were brand new, relatively new. Today, they're standard stuff, but they were unproven at the time. And we ended up going with a sag mill um, after the uh, after the startup, and again, it worked like a charm. So, um, the, um, and the um, one of the discussions was to whether to recover the nickel, and. Uh, Unfortunately, got pushed aside, and uh, they didn't. The nickel wasn't recovered, but um, there was a lot of work to make sure that you could extract virtually all the uranium and have virtually none of the nickel end up in your product. So, mm -hmm. so it was a um, the unit operations were much, not much different from uh, from the past, but we did a lot of new uh, new work on, uh, because of the high grade and. Um, in the end, the mill at the time, the, uh, the mill happened to start up about the time the uh, uranium prices were high, so it was yeah, made a ton of money. Still is, so still.
did you uh, travel much for your work? Did you did you uh, work in other countries or? or I have. Um, I haven't traveled much recently, in the last year or two. But since I've well, since I've worked for AMIC, uh, I've been in Africa several times. I've been in Australia half a dozen times. I've been in the States several times. I've been in South America twice. So it's um, the part of this job is uh, in the consulting. You have to be willing to travel. Mm -hmm. and I must admit, I mean, I don't find traveling much fun anymore. I mean. Uh, First time I flew, I went from Montreal down to New York City. And like we landed in New York City, coming in from the ocean with all the lights on. I was just so excited. Right? Now I got on a plane. As long as I don't lose my luggage and get me there on time, it's all I ask for. But what I do find is going to these other places, meeting the new people, you know, being in that environment, looking at the new challenges. That's wonderful. So it's just traveling back and forth is also good. Um. Have, have your travels led you to any insights on the particular characteristics of uh, business or engineering culture in Canada? I think the engineering culture in Canada is, is pretty sound, um, but especially in the uranium industry. When one thing that surprised me is that, and I found this, there is a um, there's a Canadian way of doing things, there's an American way of doing things, which are pretty close. There's an Australian way of doing things, which is quite different. And there's a South African way of doing things, which is quite different. And then there's a Eurasian way of doing things, which is quite different. And it's just all those industries. The Eurasian industry isn't very big. But it's just all those those different areas where they call different universes. They don't talk to each other. Um, and um, I read some, uh, when I was chemical, I would do diligence on a, on a uh, property that they were thinking of buying. I saw the test work. And the test work was just, they said, well, this doesn't work. And, well, it works. We run it here. They didn't, but they didn't read the literature from Canada. So one of the things I've been doing here at uh, Amit Foster Wheeler is preparing our uranium booth um, to basically be able to say, you know, no matter where you are, we can bring to your project the best available global technology, not the best available local technology, the best available global technology tailored for you. I think we're in a pretty good position to do that, and that, I find that really satisfying. It's very. <clears throat> I've been very frustrated looking at something and say, well, you know, they turned that down and I know it works because they, you know, they were Australian and the operation was in Canada. So, so what's Amex role in the, in the uranium industry? What services do you offer? Um, well, uh, Amex is, uh, we're a very big, Amex Foster Wheel is a big company now, we're 40,000 people. And um, for the uranium, uh, for uranium especially, I think it's important to be on the ground where you're going to uh, design and uh, build operations. And we are. Uh, we have offices basically every in every uranium uh, active area in the world. So, um, and we uh, we can provide essentially cradle and grave from concept to uh, proposal. So we can, if you're your exploration company, we can help you with designing and analyzing your uh, your drill program. Uh, we can take your drill results and uh, do a line design. We can take your drill results and do test work and design a, a mill for you, uh, tailings handling, your flow treatment, uh, environmental protection, and then we can design a mill for you. And we can help you commission it, and we can help you fix it up or optimize it as you're running, and when time, time comes to decommissioning, we can do that too. So the part I do is mill design, <laughs> so we'll be, the company can do cradle to grave, so to speak. And uh, AMAC? owns a certain series of technologies and a certain mill setup? Or? No, we don't own the technology. We're aware of it. I see. And, <clears throat> and parts of it we're experts in. <coughs> but no, we don't. Uh, AMEC doesn't develop. Uh, we, will do, we, we sometimes, well, we recently did some test work. We've, de we've developed innovative flow sheets or innovative operations. <clears throat> but essentially, that belongs to the company we did it for. Could you uh, describe your uh, involvement with CIM? <laughs> I've been involved with CIM uh, pretty continuously since I started with Intro in 1974. <clears throat> and uh, one thing I found with uh, CIM <clears throat> is that the more involved you are, the more fun it is. It's a great organization, I mean, wonderful people, and you make friends for life. <clears throat> but I've done um, 
In CIM, I've had most positions that exist. Well, I've been a, a, a chair of a local branch in three different places. I'm the chair of a local branch here now because nobody else wanted to do it. Um, <clears throat> I've been a district vice president. Uh, I've been chair of the Canadian Mental Processors. And uh, <clears throat> I was president of CIM a few years back. So very fulfilling. Very, you know, it's, it is wonderful. Um, are you involved in, with any other professional organizations? Not really. I mean, I'm a, I'm a professional engineer, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not involved in the, the committees or the, uh, <clears throat> the management. So um, I have, I'm involved. I belong to a car club, <laughs> but uh, no, professionally, yeah, professionally it's been CIM, and especially in CIM, the Canadian Mental Processors. So. Um, for instance, you've been described as a public advocate for nuclear power. Um, can you describe how the conversation around uh, nuclear power has changed over time? Well, the um, nuclear power, I think it's, it's unfortunate that uh, you know, the <clears throat> nuclear industry was born in a bomb rather than a... Uh, well, but I, I do think that nuclear power is, is, is the answer, at least part of the answer. <clears throat> to uh, you know, uh, cutting back our, our CO two emissions, it's also on a on a you know, on a lifetime basis. It's as clean as wind and solar. So um, I had the opportunity because I was a CIM distinguished lecturer, and uh, the title of my talk was "The Role of Uranium and Nuclear Power in Combating Global Climate Change," and I gave that talk thirty or forty times. Mm -hmm. So it's a, um, and in some places I had a lot of opposition, and other places people just sort of nod because I tried to make a case. So uh, and I've been um, in an advocacy position like that, well, for decades now. Mm -hmm. So I don't give that talk much anymore. But every now and then, if somebody wants it, so I pull it up and do it again. So you find that public attitudes have changed over time. Public attitudes. Um, What most people know about nuclear power is the accidents. <clears throat> so they know about Chernobyl, they know about Fukushima. But you know, I think that the uh, the fact that you have uh, those are those are both very bad accidents. Neither of them were caused by the uh, technology; they were caused by essentially incompetent or stupid people. So, and um, it's the same argument for uh, you know, automobiles. You know. Stop using cars because they kill people. No, you try to make them as safe as possible. So it's the same argument for nuclear power. Part of the nuclear, part of the rep part of the opposition to nuclear, not just nuclear power, but the whole nuclear industry, is not rational. It is. Uh, it's not based on fact. It's uh, some of it's uh, emotional. Some of it's religious, <coughs> which are you know much argument there. I guess human factors and safety culture, these are all big issues in, in this sort of industry. Yeah, the, um, given the number of reactors there are on the planet and the number of hours they've been running, the uh, safety performance is pretty good. I mean, uh, Chernobyl was caused by a batch of uh, Soviet Army people who went in and shut down the computer and tried to run the plant outside the design um, parameters and failed. So, um, and, uh, Fukushima, essentially, the earthquake shook the plant, and the plant shut down exactly the way they're supposed to in an earthquake. It was the tsunami that took them out, and uh, the tsunami caused shut, took out their uh, backup power, and that's what caused most of the real damage. If there hadn't been a tsunami, they would have been shut down or restarted again and built something. Mm. How has uh, the global demand for mine, mined uranium affected your field over time? Well, the more demand there is, the more projects are. Or the, if you're working for a company like Chemical, then the more there, the more demand there is, the more company, the more cash the company has to build on new projects, new developments, and so on. So, <coughs> essentially, and you know, uh, like all design engineers, are consulting firms and operating to you. You know, the metal price goes up and down. Your fortune. Goes up and down. So, what do you think the prospects are for the industry in sort of the near the near term? 
<clears throat> I think the price will go up. It's beginning to, um, one of the things that's kept it down the last little while was the, uh, after Fukushima, Japan shut down all its reactors. They're maybe beginning to restart those reactors. But that, that doesn't mean much <clears throat> in the global supply and demand, but it means a lot emotionally. So, and the, just, the, just the perception. So, and given the number of reactors that are running and the numbers being built, there's going to be, have to be more uranium production fairly soon. So I expect the price will come up uh, because the price where it is is too low to get new operators into, into operation. Um, how present or absent uh, were women in, in your workplace is uh, throughout your career? Fairly absent. I mean, the mining industry is um, fairly conservative in that regard. <clears throat> it's not as bad as it used to be. I mean, um, when I started first year at Queens, I mean, you have your orientation and so on. And the, the guys, I was in Science 65, so those guys in Science 64 that were talking about it. One of the things they were proudest of <clears throat> was that they had a woman in their class the year before. And a batch of them decided they didn't want a woman. So they, what they told us is they dated her out. They just bothered her so much, let's go up to coffee, get some movie and stuff like that. And they made sure she failed her exams at Christmas and she was bought. And they were proud of it. And even then, I, mean, I, was, I was appalled. But, you know, partly because of that attitude. Um, in engineering and gender. Um, in the four years I was at Queens, we had no women in our class. Uh, we had a class, of graduating class of 200, none. That's changed, thank God. But, um, and the mining industry, as conservative as it is, um, is sort of behind the, behind the curve. When I worked in um, when I worked in Thompson, um, I did it, I was in what you call mill process technology, so the technical side of it. And I was considering might like to get into operations. So I went and talked to the, the mill superintendent, and he said I couldn't get a job in operations because I didn't weigh enough. <laughs> well, <laughs> he said, "Oh, that's a rule." So I went and asked one of the guys who'd been there a long time. He says, "Well." The purpose of the rule is to keep women out of the workforce. Wow. Yeah. So, and that's, you know, there are still, and, uh, and there are still places where it's considered unlucky to have a woman go on to I've seen that. So it's, that's going, it's, it's disappearing, but it hasn't, it, hasn't talk, it hasn't gone away totally. So, I mean, uh, I'm very sensitive this, because I, mean, as I, said, I have five daughters. So, and uh, when they were growing up, I was telling them, you can do any, anything, you, anything you feel like. And, uh, so, uh, the, um, the, that idea of, you know, women are not tough enough, uh, they don't understand math, it's just, it's just bullshit. <laughs> so, so did you give your daughters down to engineering, or no. science kids? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, have you ever worked in a particularly dysfunctional job or organization? Anything memorable? Um, well, one place I worked, a, um, we had a, a large manual of ethics, and um, but it wasn't followed. And there were times when people would violate, you turn to page 32, right, and there's a violation, nothing happened. And I found that very disturbing, because it meant that just, you know, you the rule, uh, well, the, I didn't, the ethics volume was fine the way it was, but the fact that it was ignored and violated, uh, I thought that was, uh, that was bad. That was nice. And one other operation I was at, uh, looking at, uh, I, I took some leadership training, and um, the, um, my group uh, was trying to, I tried to run it like a family, and I got, you know, they said, you know, make me feel like that. There's about 20 of us, and some of the other, Manager, especially senior people, says you can't do that. You know, you can't be friendly. You got to be. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I said, no, that's uh, that's not the way. In uh, in my group, you know, I, I don't tell people what to do because it's engineering things across the. I'm not competent in those disciplines. So, so what I try to do, what I try to do is you make sure you find the best people you can for the job. You first make sure that everybody understands what the goals are and how we're going to accomplish them together, and then you. 
make sure that they have everything they need to do their job the best way they know how, then you get the hell out of the way. And I had a lot of pushback to that. I'd say, no, 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 you've got to be the boss. You've got to tell them what to do. So I didn't say that out loud. So it was very frustrating. So what are some of the other challenges that you faced over, over your career? Um, you have to learn new things if you change jobs. Uh, you change, uh, dis not so much discipline, but change uh, change the part of the industry you're in. Uh, and I went from um, Ottawa working in, uh, in the uranium industry, where the tonnages at your mill are in the range of, say, you know, 100 tons an hour. Uh, I, went from, I went from there to I moved to Calgary, and I was working in an oil sands project, where the plant we were designing is 50,000 tons an hour. So here. <laughs> it, but, but the, and again, but I say, as long as you got the basics, you know, the chemistry and the physics and the math, it's a different scale, it's a different commodity, it's different chemistry, you should pick it up. So um, I think that's one thing in, well, I suppose all industries are like that, but as long as you've got that sound grounding, uh, you can do pretty well anything. So, uh, that's one of the things I've taught to, uh, I, I speak a lot to university students recently, uh, here and especially in Edmonton. And I tell them is that you know, in, in your early years, don't don't fence yourself off. Don't, um, I mean, at one point, I was looking for a job in uh, I was in Calgary, looking for a job because the you know, Los Angeles project had gone more. And uh, I was told that a company in BC was looking for a hydrometallurgist. So I phoned them up and I said, "What do you think a hydrometallurgist does, and what do you think a hydrometallurgist knows?" So they told me, "says Oh, I'm a hydrometallurgist by that." And uh, so I applied for the job and got it. So I, I had never called myself a hydrometallurgist before. So one of the things I tell people, as long as you got that fundamental fundamentals behind you, don't cut yourself off because you don't think you're a hydrometallurgist. What's the most difficult project that you've worked on? MacArthur River. It was also the most fun. Uh, MacArthur River is the first of those really high grade mines that uh, an average grade in the early years of 20% U3 weight. You know, uh, the, uh, the global average is about 100 ppm. So I mean, it's, it's astonishingly high grade. Mm. But because it was so high grade, it had to be handled differently and mined differently <clears throat> than the lower grade ones. So uh, I was with Chemical, you know, and we basically had to invent everything because nobody. This is the best kind of projects I think for an engineer. Are the ones that nobody's ever done before. They're all good, you know. Um, so we had to uh, invent a mining system. Uh, it's raised bore mining, uh, which is now raised bores that existed before, but they never really used to mine ore before. We had to invent the way to handle the ore after it was mined. Uh, we had to, uh, because we couldn't figure out a way to safely hoist the, the ore as rock, um, we had to process it partly underground. So we invented a way to handle that war underground, to, to uh, grind it in a say, which I think is still the small, world, world's smallest sag mill, um, to handle it underground. Uh, we had to get it up to surface. Um, we invented, well, we invented ways to blend it underground, to store it. Uh, there were pumps available, and so we, we uh, we invented this hydraulic hoisting system that pumps the ore to the surface as a slurry. Now, not to the pumps that never been used before, but those pumps had never been used for that application before. Um, then we had to get the ore from the MacArthur River to Key Lake, 80 kilometers away, so we had to build a road between. And we had to invent a way to get the ore there safely, and, uh, and uh, we invented a system that uh, holds it in tanks on the back of the truck and takes it down, empties the MacArthur, or fills the MacArthur, empties in the Key Lake, and go back and forth. All of that, all of that was random. Nobody ever done it before. So that was it. Was difficult. It was very difficult, and there was a certain resistance to things because they were new. But it uh, it worked like a charm. So uh, difficult, but it's probably a lot. It was it was a lot of fun and really very satisfying. So. What's the fondest memory that relates to your work? I just. Seeing the operations I've helped design start up and run successfully, 
that um, I get a huge charge. I mean, I, I love this job. I get a huge charge out of, and it, it starts literally in scratch on a, not a back problem, a piece of paper, and you make a little things, and you get a basic full diagram. And when you see that go all the way through the process and be something like Key Lake or MacArthur River, I like that. I really like that. So, what sorts of uh, social activities were, were you involved with with your coworkers after work? Oh, I uh, used to play hockey, um, uh, hockey, softball, that kind of thing. You know, uh, either company team or, or a town league. Bowling. Bowling was funny when we were in Thompson. Bowling was really important. Bowling in winter is one of the big things in Thompson. Because it's so damn cold out, and um, we were in a uh, a, uh, a mixed league, uh, mostly married people, and um, my wife's not very athletic, and so uh, we you know you bowl your first game and you get a you, know, you get your uh, you get your score counted, and she got pregnant at the time, and amazingly enough, the more pregnant she got, the better she bowled. <laughs> So at the end of that season, she had the baby, and we won a we won a bowling trophy, but that tall. <laughs> so that was, and people were just standing around saying, ah. "So that was fun. That was uh, that's um, the, um, especially in remote towns like that, you do a lot of things like that. You know, you're you're you know, you're a very tight town, and too far to go, uh, you don't go much. So uh, were there any social problems like drugs or alcohol that were particularly apparent in, in your line of work? Well, they're there, um, and uh, all the places I work have dealt with it fairly well. But uh, it can be a problem. And, and uh, when I was at uh, Rabbit Lake, we had one of the uh, chiefs uh, nearby came in and talked to me and said, "You know, <clears throat> the people who work here are going back, and they're they're, they're they earn more than most of the other people. <clears throat> they're drinking alcohol." So you got to stop them drinking alcohol, and I said I can't do that. I mean, I know your problem, but I can't. I can, you know, we, we certainly handle it here on, on, on the site, but you'll have to handle it, you know, in your home, and I'll do anything I can to help. But uh, <clears throat> we have the same problem with uh, people moving. You know, in Saskatchewan, uh, people get a job, they start earning a lot of money or more money. And some of them would move away from the north and to live in a place where they're successful too. And I had hey, about the same way. Another fellow come in, one of the chiefs, and say, you know, you got to stop them moving away. I said, I understand the problem, but you know, I can't tell people people who work here. I can't tell them they're moving. But those are, especially when you're in a remote place like that, the the problems in the surrounding areas. Um, they don't become your, your well become your problem. You may not be able to solve them, but you have to help because you can't ignore uh, what's going on. It's going to affect you one way or the other. So. I, uh, I interviewed uh, Ingen Osberg the other day, and I think you've worked with him in the past. He uh, seemed to believe that Canada is losing ground in terms of research and development, especially private research and development, compared to where it's been in the past. Do you have uh, any opinions on that? Yeah, I agree. I think the um, Canadian industry is investing too little in R and D, and uh, I think the problem uh, comes from uh, <coughs> focus on the short term, and R and D is long term. So, but you have to have to finance R and D. You have to be convinced and have faith in the fact that what you're investing now will have a return in the future, even if you know exactly what that return is going to be or what the problem is. But I think, um, but I, I agree with Angus. I agree that the corporate brief R and D in this country is not what it used to be, and it would be better if it was brought back up to staff. Up to staff. Um, can you identify some Canadian accomplishments uh, in within the, the uranium field of uranium mining and metallurgy? Well. I think the uh, Canadian uranium industry has a very, very good safety record. Um, in Saskatchewan, the Canadian uh, you know, uranium mining industry has been a leader in working with uh, First Nations people, employing them, training them. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the operations in Northern Saskatchewan are, are essentially the gold standard 
and uh, I know people who've visited from uh, from Africa, from Australia, and trying to find out how why it works here and how to make it work uh, back home. Um, this uh, there's a lot of fly-in, fly-out operations around the world now, and the first one was here. The first one was Rabbit Lake, mm -hmm. so uh, not by design, and that was uh, of Gulf Minerals at the time. And uh, Gulf Minerals were intending to build another town. And I know I know that because I've seen a design for it, but never to Rabbit Lake. And bless their hearts, the uh, provincial government at the time saw that Beaver Lodge, the Beaver Lodge mill that I talked about before, was going to be closing down soon, and they were going to have essentially a ghost city, a ghost town in the Iranian city. Mm -hmm. And they said, we don't want to do that anymore. So they, they denied <coughs> Gulf Minerals <coughs> the right to build the town. No. So the Gulf of Minerals guys said, ah, what are we going to do now? Uh, some of them went down to, uh, because it was Gulf Minerals, they were Gulf Oil. And they were at the Gulf Oil office in uh, New York City. And they were in a meeting, um, apparently moaning about this and saying, now what are we going to do? We're, we're still. And one of the guys in the uh, meeting said, well, how many people have you got on site? He told him. He says, we fly more than that. People have to wear drawings all the time. Huh. So and it, 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 it is a it is a, the fly in fly out if you're in the right kind of person right the right kind of situation is superb because you don't have the town you don't have a ghost town you don't have to build the schools and hospitals and stuff like this you can build a really really nice residence right you're very comfortable to live in with fabulous food and you can live in Saskatoon and work in North Saskatchewan so it's a um, it works so well at Rabbit Lake I said it, it's um, there are dozens and dozens of them around the world now, but we didn't push that. So that, that's one, and that's one Canadian contribution to global mining that I think very, very few people recognize. I think in the uranium industry, we handle very high-grade ores very safely. Um, we know how to design uh, and operate uh, from the highest grade to the lowest grade because we've done it. Um, and I think the Canadian, at least the Canadian uranium mining industry is has been very innovative, not afraid to try new things out of the heart. So, and we're fairly tenacious. Look at the square life. And then nobody gave up. Just keep, mm -hmm. keep going and going and going and make it work. So. Can you like to say something about uh, the operation in Cigar Lake? Uh, some of the technical achievements there? Well, Cigar Lake is very difficult. There are, there are times when Mother Nature wins, and Cigar Lake mine is one of the times when Mother Nature was, you know, was a real struggle. Uh, it's very difficult to mine. Because it's not the ore is not really rock. The ore is in a clay lens, and if you bore into the clay, it goes and closes up. So that's why you have to freeze it. Uh, it has to be remote mining uh, because the grade's so high. Uh, same as the remote mining method at uh, MacArthur. Uh, the jet boring method uh, that is developed, I think, it is very, very, very clever, and it works really well. So um, okay, uh, there, there's another operation which. Um, they borrowed a lot of the uh, things we developed, the car search, the underground riding, and so on. But the mining system itself is, is, is unique. It's a real, real, you know, uh, but unique. A lot of people say it's sort of unique, or it's very unique. That's wrong. Unique means one of. That's mm -hmm. what unique means. And Cigar Lake is unique. So. so this was the first application of jet boring to uranium mining? Or? As far as I know, it's the first application of jet boring to mining anything. Oh, really? Um, so maybe just to finish up, uh, who would you say uh, has been your greatest mentor or has had the greatest impact on your on your career? I think the um, the guy who ran the lab at Eldorado Nuclear, one of the guy named Alan Ashbo, and um, he was a wonderful guy. He was a he was an immigrant from Britain just after World War II, and he arrived with a you know cardboard suitcase. <clears throat> got a job and um, he went to his bachelor's, master's, PhD while he was working. And he ended up as a vice president at, uh, of El Dorado uh, not, long after, uh, not long after I left. But when I worked, I really loved him. And he was the guy who advocated to me to, for me to get that job that meant so much to me at, uh, at Key Lake. So when, when I left El Dorado, I knew it was a good thing. I had to do it. It was, you know, and he knew I had to do it. But it's the only time I ever went in and told the guy I was leaving and we both cried. We wept. So I loved the guy. And he 
he was he did a he, he set a he set a, a, a standard for me a way of treating people. It, um, it was very gentle, very kind. But they, yeah, I there have been others, but I think overall, yeah, I think he he, he did a major difference. I think that's true of other people. But. What do you believe to be your greatest contribution to the uh, to the world of metal, metallurgy or mining? Well, technically, I think that uh, I've been involved in uh, designs or uh, <clears throat> upgrading plants. Um, I've been lucky to be at the right place at the right time, especially here in Saskatoon. So, uh, of the uh, uranium operations in northern Saskatchewan, I've been involved in design engineering for all of them. So that's a, a kind of a legacy. <clears throat> but I think also um, being part of CIM. And one of the things I emphasize there was leadership. You know, we developed the, uh, the leadership training and leadership development uh, operation in CIM, which is, uh, you know. So I think the, uh, apart from the technical thing, I think it's just a, a, a way of leading. As I say, you're not a boss. You don't have to be big and pound your chest and scream at people. Mm -hmm. There's better ways to do it. And I think I tried to do that myself and uh, advocate and try to teach other people so what are some of the most important lessons that you feel you've learned in your career? You never know as much as you think you do. <laughs> you never know everything. You can always be surprised. Um, the, uh, yeah, there's always there's always things to learn, and uh, for me that's that's important. If I'm in a job when I'm not learning anything, I'm not happy. I like the challenges, and uh, I think more learning new things, stretching yourself. We'll do that forever. And some some of those things when you're you're wrong are you know you're just way um, just when I first started working for uh, for chemical, uh, a good friend of mine was the uh, superintendent of so that and he phoned me and he said uh, we're making hydrogen in our auto clips. and I said no and he says no we are we know it's hydrogen and I said well then you reach the rubber lining and the hydrogen is you know your the acid is eating out your the shell of your auto clip. no it's not that so. Everybody, I mean, and everybody I knew, everybody he talked to said, no, it can't be happening. And it was. So all the so-called experts on that point were wrong. So we got it fixed and we, uh, and, uh, we never did find out exactly what was happening, but uh, we got it managed. But um, the university here is going to start teaching mineral processing and extractive metallurgy next month. I've submitted that hydrogen generation problem to them as a doing a master's or PhD project because I want to know what the hell's going on. I've kept it, <laughs> waiting for 20 years. So, but uh, yeah, it is you always have to be ready to be told no, you're wrong, or you don't understand, and uh, just keep working. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we finish up? Anything for the record? Well, I think. Um, the mining industry, mining and milling and mineral processing industry has a tremendous number of facets. I mean, how many metals are there? Uh, and uh, there's still a lot to learn in all areas. And, but uh, one of the things I really uh, like about the uranium industry is relatively new. I mean, we've been mining copper for what, 5,000 years? Long time. We've been mining uranium on purpose only since the 1940s. So it's relatively young, and there's and because of that, there's still an immense amount to learn there, and that's one of the things attracted to me, attracted to me in the first place. Is, is, is that, uh, you haven't got thousands of years of experience; you've got like a decade. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for uh, for agreeing to the, to the interview. Oh, thank you. That's uh, very very flattered that you <laughs> wanted to talk to me. So.